Hello, I want to welcome you to worship at whatever time it is and wherever you are because worship does not require us to be in one space. Worship is what happens between us and the Holy Spirit, God the Father, and God the Son. And anytime we listen on television or on the radio or on our computer and our hearts are enlivened to give ourselves away, we are in worship. It's really hard right now for me because I'm used to this place being full of people at 10 o'clock on Sunday morning. And it's not full of people. But I know that our hearts long to be with one another and that our spirits are connected through the Holy Spirit because we are the body of Christ throughout the world seeking to serve God with our best. So I invite you now to quiet your heart, your mind, to enter a prayerful attitude and let us worship together as we give our lives humbly and holy to God. Let's worship. Holy God, you have called us to this place to worship and to give ourselves away. Help us to be about the business of your son and yours. Help us to be about changing lives, about offering grace, about seeking forgiveness and repentance and about changing lives our ways as we go forward each day. Father, be with those that we have just shown who are in need of prayer. Be with those that we don't know about who are broken and bring them to our attention. Help us to reach out to each other, to the lonely and the lost, to those who are oppressed, to those who are persecuted, and to offer our lives to stand in the gap, to protect them and to lift them up. Help us to see each other as we truly are and help us to see ourselves even more clearly. We thank you, Father, for what you have done through Jesus Christ our Lord. We thank you for the blessing of this place of worship. We thank you for the ability to go around the world through technology. We thank you that you have blessed us to meet all our needs each day. For it's in the name of your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ, that we pray. Amen. And it's in his name that we join together praying as he taught, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done 
on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture lesson, again, comes from Matthew. We're preaching through Matthew here, or I'm preaching through Matthew. I guess you're listening to me preach through Matthew. Chapter 11, verses 16 through 19 and 25 through 30. And this is just following last week's message about go and tell John what you see. But now Jesus has moved on, and he's preaching to another group of people. And it starts off with Jesus speaking to the crowd. But to what will I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to one another. We played the flute for you and you did not dance. We wailed and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating or drinking and they say he has a demon. And the son of man came eating and drinking and they say, Look, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners, yet wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. At this time, Jesus said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for such as was your gracious will, All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all you who are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. I want you to realize here, Jesus is starting off talking not about everyone. Jesus is talking about the rulers of the temple, the rulers of the land, if you would. Just before this, it says, what did you come out to see? Did you come out to see a reed blown in the wind? You see, Herod and the other wealthy political folks had houses along the Jordan River Valley where they overlooked the Jordan where John was. And the reed was a symbol of Herod. Did you come to see Herod? Who is the ruler, who lays down the rules, who gives the law as John did, who was tough and rough? Or did you come to see somebody else who was meek and mild and easy and easygoing? 
And he says, but what will I compare this generation? It's like children sitting in the marketplace and calling to one another. I want you to think about a bunch of kids together. <clears throat> Playgrounds tend to be like this. There tend to be a couple of groups of kids, and one group wants to play house. One group wants to play cowboys and Indians. One group wants to play army. One group wants to play school. And he said, the first group wanted to play like marriage. Play the flute and let's dance and let's have a good time and, and let's do this and let's do that and let's enjoy life and be filled with peace and joy and grace. Which would have been like Jesus. Calling people to come and to follow him and to be blessed by him and to feel his presence. The second group says, no, nah, we don't want to do that. We want to play a dirge and play funeral. We want to tell you all the bad things that are going to happen if you don't change. We want, to, we want everybody to be sad and feel bad about themselves and think about their brokenness and change, how they need to change and all this other stuff. That would have been John. John came preaching and baptizing for the forgiveness of sins. And John preached a hard word. He was a hard man who went around in camel skin and ate insects in the desert. He was a rough person. He didn't eat and he didn't drink, but they said he was a demon because he was just too rough. He was just too mean. He was just too hard. He was just too much. His thoughts and the way he preached were too hard and, and they didn't agree with the temple and they didn't agree with the high priest and they didn't agree with the law because he called people to a higher level of living. And then Jesus comes and Jesus eats and drinks with his friends. Even to the point of being willing to create wine for a wedding feast so that the party could continue. And they said, look, he comes eating and drinking with tax collectors. He's, he's a glutton. He's a drunker. He's a friend of sinners. He's a friend of tax collectors. We don't want to be messed with him either. You see, there are people in this world, it doesn't matter which side you're on. If you're on the side of easygoing grace, not, easy, not free grace, but grace that forgives, or the side of a rule of law that ties down, they don't want to be on either. Not because they don't want what they're offering. You see, John is the end of the Old Testament prophet. He's Elijah returned, and he's preaching the law, the true law that calls for people to help each other, that calls for the people who have cheated others to repent. And pretty much in those days, the temple folk were cheating others. They were as bad as the tax collectors who they called out because of the temple tax. But they didn't think so because, well... None of us typically think it's bad when it's what we're doing. We're not as bad as somebody else. But John came as the end of that Old Testament prophet uh, style of rule that talked about the rules and put down the rules and said, these are the rules. And you have to live by the rules, and the rules are the rules. And now as John has died, we move into a new period, a period of grace, a period of of being covered by the forgiveness of Jesus Christ that does call for repentance, but calls more for love. It's not about keeping the rules perfectly. It's about loving Christ and loving others and giving your life for others. And, and Jesus' way is a way of love that's easier sometimes. And Jesus is saying to the temple elite, look, we preach this, and you like that, now we preached this, and you don't like that. And who are you? Wisdom. Wisdom is an important thing in the Platonic world, which the, the Hellenized world that Jesus lived in believed in wisdom. And that wisdom would bring wholeness and goodness and joy to people. Jesus is wisdom. Wisdom is going to be vindicated by her needs. By what I do, Jesus is saying, I will prove who I am, and I will set the world free through my life. You see, it's a big difference between 
preaching law and preaching grace because law binds. Law demands. Law holds us down. Grace sets us free. It demands something of us. It demands us to change the way we live and to live in a higher place than the law did because living under grace, you can't hurt anybody if you love them. And if you do hurt them, you repent and you go back to them and repent. It's kind of like one of the 12 steps that says, I will make amends for anything I've done wrong where it is safe for me to do so. I will repent of any wrong I have done where it is safe for me to do so in person to the other person. I will make it right. And John just says, oh, you got to go do the offerings and you got to do this because you were wrong. You see, it takes it out of the hands, our hands, out of the hands of the priest, out of the hands of the temple, and puts it into the hands of God the Father to forgive based on what we do in our heart. Jesus has told the temple elite, you bind up heavy burdens and you put it on the backs of others. Now he's telling them, you don't really care what we do. You just don't like us. You just don't want to follow us. You just don't want to be like us. You, you, you want to be in charge humanly. And Jesus comes and says, Lord, thank you. Thank you. You have hidden these things from the wise and the prudent, the intelligent, the intellectual, the, the ruling class, the chief priest and the political people who are the ones who have education, who have studied. And, and you've revealed it to infants, to babes, to the poor. I come to bring good news to the poor. Because you see, typically in Jesus' day, the ones who accepted him were the ones who were broken, who were hurting, who were poor. And, and all they knew is Jesus showed them love. Jesus showed them grace. Jesus showed them hope. Jesus came to set them free. Not just from sin and death, but from the bonds of the law. From the bonds of the law. Jesus says to them, Come unto me, all ye who are weak and heavy laden. I will give you rest. He was not just talking about people who worked hard every day. Actually, I don't think he was even talking about the people who work hard every day. I think he was talking about the people who were burdened down under the law trying to keep the law because the law was so particular. And not only was the law particular, the chief priest in the temple had made it more difficult. Your offering had to be such and such, and to be approved, it had to be bought from so and so, and to be right, it had to be this, and to do this, it had to do that, and to this, it had to do, and blah, 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 blah. And we see and we experience a brokenness of people, and we hear Jesus saying, Come to me. Now, the rich didn't have to worry about coming to Jesus in that day because they didn't feel like they were heavy burdened because they could pay their way out of it. They could buy their way through the system, but the poor couldn't. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. You know, a yoke is a heavy thing. It's a big log-looking thing, a, a beam-looking thing that would tie two oxen together. And it was about so, you know, like this. And, and he's saying, take my yoke, which we know is heavy, upon you and learn from me. Being yoked with Christ. Because Christ will bear the burden for you. I am gentle and humble in heart. You know, one of the big differences between Jesus and the ruling priest is his humility. Jesus came dressed as a poor man, probably not even wearing shoes who wandered without a home to go to because his family thought he was crazy and he'd never married and built his own home. 
But there's a humility about him, not only that, that he came to give his life away to us. That he was here to give us something. And the chief priests and the scribes were just the opposite. They were there to receive something. Kind of like all of our politicians today who want to know all of our politicians. Who want to know what's in it for me. What am I going to get out of this? If I go to the House or the Senate and I can serve six years, I get a lifetime retirement of over $100,000. Some of them almost $200,000. I'm not worried about what I can give you people. I'm worried about what you're going to give me. Now, there are some who are not that way. But I'd say the majority of them are as or more interested in the money than they are in serving us. It's the nature Because even in the political world of Jesus' time, that's the way it was. Jesus is humble. They are proud. Jesus lays himself down. They lift themselves up. Jesus serves us. They want us to serve them. And here's what he says that's most important here. You will find rest for your bodies. That's not what he said, is it? You will find rest for your souls. Jesus is talking about a spiritual rest here that we will receive when we join together with him and he leads us. Jesus is talking about a respite from the beatings we've taken. Jesus is talking about a wholeness we will receive in our souls and it won't matter what happens to our bodies at that point because we know there's more. We know there's more, and when our souls are rested, no matter what's going on outside of us, we have peace within, and we have joy. He says, my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. I'm not going to pile up a whole bunch of rules and laws on you. Now, we have, too often in Christianity today, become like the Pharisees and piled up rules and laws like, Oh, well, if you're a woman, you can't cut your hair. I have a friend whose sister has never even trimmed the ends of her hair, and she's 40-something years old, because the Bible literally says, never cut. The Bible says that women shouldn't wear men's clothing. So for years, women couldn't wear pants, because that was men's clothing. Never mind that in Jesus' day, men wore dresses, because in the Roman Empire, it was illegal to wear pants. Uncut, oh, long hair is a man shaming a woman's glory. Yet in Jesus' day, hair wasn't cut that short. You see, too often churches and church sex and people have made heavy rules to pile upon others. My favorite one's not religious, but I'm going to share it with you. My, uh, I guess she'd be my great-grandmother my mother, who's living in Georgia's grandmother, they would go stay with her, and eventually she came to live with them, and they would brush her hair. Well, in being young girls, they liked to whistle. And when they were brushing grandma's hair, she'd stop them and grab their hand and say, a whistling woman and a crowing hen both come to no good end. It was a rule in the house that girls couldn't whistle. I guess it wasn't ladylike, I don't know. But it used to be a rule that women couldn't be pastors. It used to be a rule that men couldn't be teachers in elementary school. It used to be a rule that, and they've all kind of fallen by the wayside as we've come to know Christ more. See, it's not about the rules. It's about your heart. Are you going to dance with Jesus? Are you going to dance when he plays the flute? I always think of the song, Lord of the Dance. We didn't sing it this week, but I always think about it. I danced in the morning when the world was begun. I danced down the stars and I danced on the sun. I love that. To imagine Jesus dancing, the creation, and the joy he was filled with. Where's your joy today? Are are you willing to dance with Jesus? Jesus. Are you willing to share love as Jesus shared love? Are you willing to give your life away for your neighbor? That's what we're called upon to do. And it is hard work. 
but it's blessed work. So, I'm going to ask you, what song do you want to dance to today? Do you want to dance to the song that heals and restores and builds? Or the song that loads up heavy burdens and destroys? We get to choose. Jesus is gracious like that. I pray that I can dance with Jesus in giving my life away to others and lifting them up and blessing them and walking beside them. Let's pray. Father, today I thank you that you sent a joyous Jesus into this world to show us how to love, how to be filled with grace, how to be forgiving, how to share our lives and give ourselves away. Because, Lord, the more we give away, the more you give us. Help us to be filled with your Holy Spirit so that it overflows from us and fills this world. In the name of your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Let us go now rejoicing and dancing to the sound of the flute. As Christ has said, he has invited us to come and to dance. And the people failed. Let us not fail. Let us go forth in the joy of Jesus Christ, our risen Lord, who has given us new life. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.